I think my batteries are dead or something, but we'll try it. Welcome today to the house of the Lord. Amen? A little loudly. That's fine. All right. Welcome to the house.
Who else? Blake? Turn this mic on, Blake. Sarah? Come on, Ashley. And Paul went as counselor. What did you learn? Oh, you're first. No, go ahead, Sarah. Okay. Well. Blake's going first. So at camp, it was amazing, and I had a lot of fun, and we had a lot of fun, and I got to make new friends, and I renewed my relationship with God, and um, most important, yeah, and then worship was great. We had a great worship team. Um, the food was camp food, so it wasn't that good, but it was edible. And um, it was it was a nice time, and I can't wait to go back next year. Next year, yep. Thank you, Blake. You're welcome. Come on, Ashley, tell us. <clears throat> um, it's always really an honor to go to camp with these kids every year. Um, I've been a youth leader for three years now, and every time I feel like I get closer just watching them, you know, just worship God and make new friends and kind of, like, bring other people into our group. Um, yeah, it was really, it's really awesome experience watching them. Amen. Come here, Paul. Tell me, what's that yellow bandana for? Well, that was our team color. So we're the yellow team. We came in 10th place. Hoorah. Yeah. <laughs> Ninth place. Oh, hey, well, we moved up. Awesome. But awesome. All right. Oh. I I really loved the camp, and we had like every uh, like when we went to the chapel, we learned about like God coming into our hearts and take control of us, and then or like because we used to take control of our own self, and like we left. We're they're talking about leaving our baggage at the at the chapel over there at God's feet, and letting us feel feel free and having like freedom to worship God. Amen. And awesome. yeah, and I love the worship. Yes. Oh, you led the worship? No, I love the worship. Oh, you love the worship. Did you lead the worship? No. Hold it up. Oh. Tell us what you did. I really liked the camp. Um, we had a lot of fun. We made new friends. <laughs> and um, I love the worship. It was fun. And that's it. Awesome. <laughs> You have one more thing. <clears throat> so for the week, our team colors had to do a memory verse. Uh, do you guys remember what the memory yeah. verse was? I saw Sarah with hers. Yeah, let's, I'll do it. Oh, Romans, 12, oh, Romans 12, 2. Yes, Romans 12, 2. So we want to do it for you guys. Awesome job. Hallelujah. 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 That went off. Awesome God. Wow. I am thrilled that our group gets to go to camp every year because you have been so faithful to bring your $1 bills and give them.
that's how they went. Cost really about $300, $250 in registration and then additional food on the way and on the way back uh, cost also, so uh, gasoline, et cetera. And uh, counselors have to pay their registration also. Our church takes care of that. But it's because of your faithfulness in giving your $1. Awesome God. And uh, what's up next is praise and worship. We're doing the offering later. All right. Y'all ready to worship the Lord? Let's worship Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
I know. I got it. Amen. Uh, I had forgotten, but I, I want us to uh, go into prayer today for Sarah Hostetler. She's not here, and her family's not here. She had to go into uh, with an ambulance to the emergency room yesterday and then to the hospital uh, due to her uh, Crohn's disease and uh, is not doing well. Uh, some complications. Hopefully today they will resolve the issues and she get to go home. Also, James Rapp, a charter member of the Deaf Church, and uh, would still be coming today, but is physically not able, uh, had to go to the hospital last night also and uh, is not doing well. So James Rapp, keep him in prayer. And if you would just stand with me as we pray for these two. Lord, today we, we go before your throne. We're asking and we're believing that today All right, here we go. We're rolling now. We're teaching a time to build. And today's topic is making investments that last. Sometimes we make investments and they don't last. Uh, some of us. Some of us have made uh, investments in silver. Back when silver, uh, a silver dollar cost uh, $35, and today it's worth maybe $25. But silver, the price will go back up. I'm not concerned about that. But we make investments that don't last, and that's really a waste of time. Also, I'm going to talk about uh, four vows or four promises. Vow making. Uh, vows that people made to God. In Nehemiah chapter 10, uh, God's people uh, felt the sting of God's spoken word in chapters 8 and 9. Paul, could you help us out there, please? It's a big distraction for the people behind you. All right. Thank you. In chapters 9, it says that there was a... Uh, they, they made a binding agreement... And that means that they decided to follow the Lord wholeheartedly. 
totally, wholeheartedly. And they put it in writing and they sealed it. They put a seal on that document, a seal that says this is there. It's going to remain. And those who agreed uh, to that covenant, their names are listed in chapter 10, verses 1 through uh, 27. The names of the individuals or the groups that made that covenant with God. In Numbers chapter 30, verse uh, 2, When a man makes a vow to the Lord and takes an oath to the obli obligate himself by the pledge, he must not break his word, but must do everything he said. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse uh, 4 says, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to fulfill it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. Because, and, and, and in this scripture, an oath or a vow or a promise in, is in the scripture is they, they include God's name before in courts I don't know if they still do you laid your hand on a Bible and vowed that you tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth so help me God when you make and include God's name in a vow, you had better be careful and pay attention and complete it. Jesus warned us in Matthew chapter 5, and we studied that entire chapter before, um, about making a vow and then not completing it. Exodus 24, the Israelites promise to do everything that God said to do. In Mark chapter 14, 29, Peter promised, you remember, uh, oh, hey, Jesus, even if all those quit you, I will never quit you, Jesus. But we know what happened a few hours later in verse 71, he says, <clears throat> he began to call down curses on himself and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Yeah, he made a vow to Jesus and then broke it. So that brings me to the question today are vows of any use today I think they are there's several reasons why I think a vow helps me to focus on doing oh, there's that good words Exactly. Yeah. Exactly what I vowed to God or what, what the Lord wants me to do. Another reason, a vow helps me express my love. Couples make vows. If you've ever gotten married, you should have made a vow to each other and to God. That's the language of love. And, it's, and love is more than just a feeling. Love is a commitment or a promise to be married until death doeth part. And that part's not easy. 
Just ask my wife. She'll tell you oh, that I have been fantastic with her. But uh, <clears throat> maybe you made some promises to God and not kept them. I have. I'll just be honest with you. I'm not perfect. I made a few promises to God and never completed it or, or I, well, I, I broke it and made the vow again and so forth. If you've broken vows to God, you're not alone. In, in Jeremiah, chapter 31, 32, says, God, uh, says that God's people broke the covenant on a regular basis. And then in verse 33, he says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Jesus started this covenant in Mark chapter 14, 24. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. The new covenant that Jesus made, uh, nothing comes from us. The old covenant, everything comes from me. But the new covenant Nothing comes from me. Everything comes from Jesus Christ. Because his grace, we can surrender, submit, obey out of love and not fear. It's good to make a vow to God. But you need to remember this. We don't succeed as Christians because we make promises to God. We succeed because we believe the promises of God and we act on them. Some of us have never become serious with your relationship with God because you never got With him. You had to read my lips. We hear sermons and we, uh, we sense the Spirit's tug at our hearts. And, but until you decide to be completely committed to him, we will not be what he wants us to be. As we celebrate commun communion today, I invite you to take the time to consider and think through the decisions the Lord wants you to make in your life. Perhaps you've been challenged or convicted through this Lessons of Nehemiah. And I think I only have about two or three more. What we need to do is listen to him right now. And put in practice what we know I need to do. If you've broken promise with him or with other people, confess it. 1 Corinthians 11.28 says, tells us to examine ourselves before we eat the bread and drink the cup of communion. We need to examine ourselves. Check it. Lord, here I am. What is my life like? Lord, I've broken some vows. Belinda, 
Alan, come. Serve the people. They're serving you. Please take it and hold it until all have been served. The scripture tells us, and you know, you've seen the picture of Jesus sitting at the table with the disciples. And he broke the bread and he gave it, and he gave it, and they took eat. They ate the bread. And then Jesus offered them the cup, and they drank from the same cup Jesus drank from. You don't have to share your cup with anyone today. But you had better share your life with Jesus Christ. Thank you. Jesus, when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Today we take the communion, we take the little wafer here, which represents the body of Jesus Christ, which was broken and beaten for you and I. Lord, I thank you that you're so faithful and you gave up yourself for me. You took my place. I'm thankful for that. Take eat. Same way, he took the cup and he supped and saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take drink. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Today we've made a vow. We've given ourselves in submission to God. The first vow I want to talk with you about is submission to God's Word. Submission to God's Word. Not what your pastor says, but what the Word of God says. That's the first vow I have for. In chapter 10, verse 29, it says, all these now joined their brothers and the nobles. And they bound themselves. They didn't tie themselves up. But they made a commitment to each other. An oath to follow the law of God. 
given through Moses, the servant of God, to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord our God. How many of you know the law of Moses? It's called the Ten Commandments. Oh, yeah. I still have my 20 from last week. Josh, 20 bucks. Come tell me the Ten Commandments. Uh, he, he backed out. Okay, Hilda. Rhonda tried it last week. Come on, Hilda. It's her turn. She's going to try it. Wake up, Blake. I am the Lord, your God. You should have no other God before me. Hang on. That's one. You should not crave, uh, carve any images and worship those images. Mm. Make Sabbath day holy. Honor your, honor your father and mother. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not bear false witness. Do not covet your neighbor's goods or neighbor's wife. How much more? That's more. Eight. Eight. Two more. You should honor your father and mother. Honor your father and mother? Save that. Oh, I have to save that. Uh, do not steal. There's just the third one. I don't know if this part is includes honor your family. Uh, no, do not make carve images. Honor your army. There should be no God. Do not use the name of Lord in vain. <laughs> Man, I almost had it back. <laughs> yeah. You have to know the laws to be able to keep them. Yeah? You have to know what God said. The first vow was submission to God. You see, these people were totally serious in their desire to, to devote themselves to Everything that was spelled out in the Word of God. You know, who does God use to make an impact on the people? Oh, God uses Billy Graham. God uses, uh, what's that woman's name? Joyce Myers. God uses those super preachers. No. Listen to what the Word of God says in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord goes to and fro looking for the super heroes. No. The eyes of the Lord goes to and to looking for Jose. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro looking for Andrew. Yeah. The eyes of the Lord are looking for Ashley. And she says, here I am, I'm ready. Yeah. Hmm. The key to, to your devotion is 
the depth of your devotion determines our impact. How much you are committed, devoted to God, to His Word, that will decide how much of an influence you are. God's not looking for strong people. God's not looking for great people. Perfect? No way. God's not even, God's not looking even for religious people. This morning he can't scans over CCC and he's looking for those who are devoted to him. Men, women, boys, girls. He's looking for the regular person who can who he can pour in his strength. And he just pours it out on them. For that to happen, we have to be, for God to use us, we have to be completely committed, dangerously devoted. Nehemiah 10, these people made that commitment. Saying, we're seriously submitting to God, His Word. And we're asking God to strike us dead if we do not complete it. I don't challenge you to tell God, strike me dead if I don't keep your word. And you'd be wise not to say that unless you are 100% committed to serving Him. Vow 2, separation from the world. We're submitting ourselves to God and His Word, but there's a second part, the vow, that called calls for a separation from the world. Verse 28 and 30 uh, says, We promise not to give our daughters in marriage to people around us or to accept their sons and daughters to be married. This is, you could argue this and discuss this all day long. And some people would not agree with what I think the Word of God said. But one thing is for sure. God is requiring um, separation and total devotion to God. No matter what the, no matter what the cost. The reason God God said do not marry these people is because um, wrong relationships can nullify you distinctive witness. Yeah. If Jose goes out to a bar and hangs around with the wild crowd, that nullifies that nullifies his Christian name. Yeah? Basically. There might be a rare situation. But if you are standing on the corner selling your body, if you are standing and listening to filthy, 
jokes and stories, that basically nullifies your witness for the kingdom. God wanted his followers to be like him, not corrupted with the world. God was concerned with purity and faith. Holiness. Uh, Joshua 23, 13 says, it says those other country people would have been snares. They would have fooled you in your worship and um, they would have destroyed what God wanted for your life. Nehemiah chapter 13, 26 says it again. It was not because of the marriages like these that Solomon, the king of Israel, sinned. Among, among the many nations, there were, was no king like Solomon. He loved his God, and God made him king over all of Israel. But even he, Solomon, was led into sin by foreign women. We don't like to admit it, but other people influence my life an awful lot. And if I'm hanging with the wrong people, they're going to influence me the wrong way. God's concern is that when we are connected with people, we need to make sure it's connected with his people. That's clearly in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For that, what does righteousness and wickedness have in common? Nothing. Perhaps you're here and you're dating someone that's not the best for your life. God's concerned about your spiritual life. And we, we have had people come up and ask us questions all the time. Uh, they, they say, they ask us, next. They ask us, Will, hey, I'm in a relationship with a person over here. You think we'll succeed? That's not the question. The question should be, will my relationship with this person Make me enjoy God's blessings and complete what God wants for my life. If your relationship with an individual does not help you succeed to build and grow in your spirit closer to God, then it's probably not a good relationship. My wife is a good relationship with me. She helps me grow in God. I try to stay up with her. It gets hard sometimes. She's away up here and I'm away down here. And I have to get on my knees and in the word more to get back up here. And then there's vow number three. No, I'm not going to talk much about this one. 
they, the people pledged themselves to God's word and to live separated lives. And then uh, they made a vow to keep the Sabbath. Verse 31. When the neighboring people bring merchandise and grain to sell on the Sabbath, we will not buy from them on that holy day. Every seventh year, we'll not plant the fields. We'll cancel all debts. I remember the sad day in Louisiana when they uh, canceled the blue law. The blue law was that no stores could be open on Sunday. Yeah, when we first went to Louisiana, no stores were open on Sunday. But that law changed. You know, another step of America on the downward spiral. And it used to be in California, no liquor stores could be open on Sunday. Another step in the downward spiral of America. And we Christians did little or nothing about it. This Sabbath was a day set up to honor God. You're here today because you're honoring God. Or maybe because your mom and dad told you you had to come. Well, if you're a kid... You're under the law. Until you're old enough to get out of the house, then you're under grace. But right now, you're under the law of your parents. Now, the second thing, this was a day of rest. We don't do that much anymore. Church on Sunday. And then we go home, we mow the grass. We paint the house. We've washed the car. I have a list of things to do today that it seems impossible to complete today. Oh, it's Sunday. It's a day I worship God. Football is getting ready to start. Then it'll be it will be uh, worshiping something else. I I'm thinking of no I better just shut up because I'm not gonna make a vow here. But my vow is <coughs> I will make sure God gets God gets His time. That's the vow you need to make. There was two guys that had a contest. They went into the woods with axes to chop trees. And they, all day long, and they, who can chop the most trees down? The one man, he went in, Didn't take a break, nothing till lunchtime. He stopped and ate real quick. Back to work. Time at five, it was over. Other guy. He took a break. He took a break. He chopped. Ate lunch. Afternoon, the same thing. He chopped took a break. He chopped, he took a break. He chopped, he took a break. In the day they counted. The guy who took the breaks won. Why? How? He said, every time I looked, you, you were sitting down on break. He said, yeah. 
but you didn't notice. On break time, I was sitting there, my axe, I was getting it sharp. Every break time. He was not just sitting there. He was sharpening his axe. With that sharp axe. Boom. It's down. I know my daddy kept a sharp axe. Kids do not play with that axe. Summertime. No shoes on. Wood pile out there. Yeah. Yeah. Dad's not here. Mom's not looking. I was about six. Whammo! Right across there on my big toe. It goes over this way. It was a sharp axe. Well, my mom just poured on some kerosene, wrapped it up, and said, you'll live. I did. You see, we need to take the time in our busy schedules to sharpen our souls, our minds. She did. I suspect she went home from last week and looked up those Ten Commandments. She did. Because last week she didn't raise her hand. This week, she was first one. Well, and I suspected something. You see, we have to have the time in the Word of God to find out what God wants me to do. Mm. So that's the Sabbath. Yeah. Matthew 6, 33, Jesus said, But seek ye first the kingdom of and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I want to take, take advantage of the time that I can be with God. Vow number four. Oh, this is the last one. To the fourth pledge. Verses 32 through 39. 32. What are the last four words in verse 32? Did she say house of God? She didn't sign it, and I didn't understand her. Okay. She said the house of God, too. I thought it sounded like something else. Yeah, it says house of God. Now, I told you before, when you're reading the book, you see a word over and over again. Let's see. Uh, there's one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine or ten times in Nehemiah talks about house of God. The people were promising to follow God's priority by submitting to him, separating from the world, and keeping the Sabbath. And by supporting the work of God. Verse 39 sums it all up when it says, We will not neglect 
the house of God. The temple in Jerusalem was the center part, the heart of the, the religious community. That represented their moral and spiritual life. That represented the presence of God. And this passage talks about some impressive stuff that supports God's work in a variety of different ways. I want to give you seven different or a few different insights, ideas about how giving can support God's work today. Giving is, it was reasonable to give. Verse 32 to 35, the people said, they assumed responsibility. <clears throat> Someone asked, what if this just became a deaf church? I told them, if this just became a deaf church, there would not be enough money to support it. Someone else, what if this just becomes a hearing church? There would not be enough money to support it. Yeah? For the new pastor who comes in, God's will will be done and we do our best to find a pastor who signs and speaks the truth of God's Word. But I noticed in this chapter the people took up the responsibility of the church. That's you and I. We have to accept the responsibility. They owned it and gave what they owned because they saw it's my privilege, my responsibility. The second thing I noticed about this, it was in obedient giving. Oh, backpacks. I'll give extra money today. It was not just last minute give, it was planned. And I know some of you had that planned giving before you came to church today. Because I saw them swiping the credit card and giving to this, this, and this. Wow, it was already planned before they came into the building. It was in obedient giving, not just, I'll give. Those who love him do what he says. Verse 32, they were carrying out the commands that were... Uh, to give. Verse 34 and 36 says, as it was written in the law. See, you have to know what the book says. There's nothing remotely optional in this book that I know of, I can think of. I don't think there's anything in this book that you have <laughs> a choice. Well, yeah, you do. You have a choice to obey or ignore. Yeah. Third thing. It was systematic in their giving. It wasn't just haphazard. Sometimes I give, sometimes I don't give. Verse 35 tells us the fruits were brought each year. There was order, or, <clears throat> orderliness about the offerings and their giving. It was systematic. 1 Corinthians 16, 2. 
at the first day of the week, of every week. And for us, that's Sunday. What does it say? Oh, I got it. I got it. Hold on, hold on. I forgot. Y'all cannot read. Let me read it for you. Uh, no, I know better. On the first day of every week, each one. That includes Mariah. That includes Blake. <clears throat> oh, that includes Alan. He's waving his tithing, tithe envelope. I picked on them because I know every week I can depend on Mariah envelope, her allowance. Every week her mom and dad gives her, she pays her tithe on it. Blake, same way. And I know I should not mention names and I won't talk about you adults. I can talk about the kids. They won't get offended, I hope. Each one should have set aside a sum of money depending on his income. That brings me to number four. It was uh, proportional, proportionate. You know, some people brought wood because the temple needed wood to burn the sacrifices. They couldn't afford silver or gold. They brought the wood. Mm. Everyone, regardless of what their income would, was, could gather gather wood and take it to the temple. Uh, or they brought flour or dove. You know, it is not the amount that's given which is important. It's more important in the spirit which we make our offering. I have to give today. Five, which is one we sometimes never do. It's sacrificial. I have said it many times, if you're planning on buying a new car, You still plan to buy that Corvette? As uh, soon as his wife lets him. Okay. I think that's what you said. This is not for you because I, I know you take care of things. If you plan to buy it next month, hold off one month and give that Four hundred or five hundred dollar that you plan first month car payment. How much now? I haven't bought a car in since '08. Probably six hundred dollars a month. I don't know. Oh, it depends on the kind of car. Well, I'm I'm thinking Lincoln, you know, or. Oh, it'd be, he says, a Lincoln will cost me over $1,000 a month, babe. Just hold on. <laughs> be patient. $1,000 a month. Okay, put it off one month and give the church that first $1,000. Hey, if you can afford that $100 a month payment, put it off one month and give to God <laughs> what 
the reason I said that, because that is sacrificial. It costs you something. While everyone cannot give the same amount, everyone can make sacrifice. Not equal giving, but equal sacrifice. Here's one all about it. Mother Teresa said, If you give what you do not need, that is not giving. If you, oh, today I have more money than I thought I had. Hey, here's a $10 bill. I, I really didn't think I had that. Whoa. There's another 20. Now, this $5 and one, two, three, four, four, six $1 bills is what I thought I had. If I just take this, which I didn't know I had, and I put it in the offering, Mother Teresa says that's really not giving. Because I didn't know I had it, I really didn't need it. Well, maybe I need it, but, but I need this $8 to eat lunch on when we go to the other church over there. Stop by McDonald's. No, I'm out of time. And buy lunch. But if I give that up, I have to give up lunch. Because my credit card swipe at the bank is empty. Uh, prescribed. Yes, Jesus. Go to submitting to God flag. God wants you and I to make investments that last. Submitting to God, that answers the question of who's in charge of my life. Separating from the world. That talks about who I spend time with. Who? Practicing the Sabbath. That talks about how we spend our time. Supporting God's work, which involves how we spend our money. If I am submitted to God, he has all of me. I hope today you are submitted to God. Not just for your money, but for your soul and for the other people who are around you. Whoa. I, I, I heard testimonies this week or last week about a guy who went uh, to work and his friend at work had a God encounter moment. He knew about that because his friend knew God. And he knew he knew God. Does Do people know that you know him? Stand for your feet. Father God, today we want our relationship with you to increase and improve. God, we ask for your help today 
in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father God, today Hallelujah. we praise you. We lift up your Jesus, name above Jesus, all names. Jesus. And we ask Hallelujah. you, Lord. No, praise we thank you, Jesus, Lord, that you have blessed these people. Yes, you have blessed Lord, us yes, with your Lord, greatness Jesus. and your awesomeness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, we just glorify you saying yes and amen. amen. Greet one Hallelujah. another in the name of Jesus. The Lord bless you. Hallelujah.